Hello, Endeavor here. So today I'm speaking with On the Offensive. How are you doing today, Hugh? Yeah, man, I'm doing pretty well. Sorry for being a bit late, everyone. It's my fault. Uh, it's no problem. Uh, it's my fault also because I forgot that uh, we actually had daylight savings time on on Sunday. So, um, but anyway, uh, so today what we're going to be talking about is the essay, uh, "The Fate of Empires" by Sir John Glob, and we might even get into a few subjects af uh, afterwards. But um, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the essay was written in 1976 by a former British general who served in World War One in the Middle East. And uh, he, he discusses how great powers rise and fall. And, you know, there's the cliche that all empires come to an end, but there's very little understanding of how this happens. And Glob argues that it's, it's due to psychological factors that kick in over the course of a lifespan of an empire. And he argues that uh, the average great power lasts about 250 years and that the phases that they go through are an age of pioneers, an age of conquest, an age of affluence, an age of intellect, and an age of decadence. And then eventually the empire dies. And what he argues is that as people become more wealthy, they become more accustomed to power, they eventually lose the, the sense of duty that it was really they really have when their empire is on the rise and that the the real spirit that got them to where they are. And eventually they get they get lazy and then the the social framework kind of falls apart and that's when the empire is in its decline and uh glob also argues that we can avoid this by studying the history of the human race rather than uh just the history of our nations in general because he he goes over plenty of different uh, empires and how they've risen and fallen and uh i actually first came across this essay when uh when uh, Hugh mentioned it on the great podcast that you do with iconoclast and chris chris dangerfield so I guess I'll start by asking, uh, what are your thoughts on the essay? Uh, it's very good. Um, when you read it, you f you know, uh, without heavy consideration, you might be tempted to think, well, that's it. Now we've worked it all out. You know, this explains everything. Um, there are there are a couple of flaws with it. I think he slightly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's trying to be dishonest, but for instance, he he does the average um, lifespan of an empire. I believe he puts it at 250 years. That's very debatable with the Roman Empire. You know, you could almost argue you could, it went on a lot longer than that. So there, there are some weaknesses in it, but overall, I think I think it's definitely it's full of insight. There's there's a lot we can learn of it, learn from it. I don't know if you want to go through it like stage by stage, some of the things he talks about, but the. the the bit about um, in in I believe he's talking about the age of decadence, and he talks about Baghdad. Um, do you want to jump in there? Should we jump in there? Yeah, the yeah parallels, I thought that, that was fascinating. That part of the essay, yeah. the yeah. parallels between yeah. Baghdad, you know, in what was it, the first half of the ninth century, right? Uh, the parallels between Baghdad then being the richest city on earth and our rich Western countries today is just it's uncanny and it's almost scary. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, what do you think of it though? But maybe before we go into these examples, what, what's your overall feeling of the essay? Do you think he's on point? Uh, yeah, I thought that it was, it was really interesting. Uh, you know, I think that he, he gave, the, I'd say that I might disagree with a few, uh, kind of the hist historiography of a few of the events that he discusses, but, um, yeah, he he does give a really good framework. Like the thing I might disagree with him on is that uh, is the same the timeline. Like you know he, how he talks about the uh, the fall of the British Empire, and it, it's true that it obviously stopped being a uh, a colonial empire in say the nineteen sixties. But I think the the phase that kind of the the phase that he identifies the age of decadence. That's really what you're really seeing today. Yes, and, yes. So it's interesting with England that we lose our empire before we'd really become a degenerate society, or at least degenerate to the extent we are today. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, we really lost our empire because we we became a bankrupt nation uh, of, during and after World War II, right? So Winston Churchill, drunkard at the helm, who just couldn't negotiate with anyone and um, dragged us into this war. It was basically a border conflict between Germany and Poland. And, you know, he says, well, you know, that's that's our problem, apparently, and we've got to go to war for this, and we've got to sacrifice millions of deaths and uh, millions of lives, rather. 
And, and yeah, so he, this is really why we lost our empire because we ran out of cash, which Glove doesn't address at all. You know, it's not, it's kind of glossed over. I, th I think the other problem is with these grand narratives of history, and a lot of people have attempted them, a lot of historians have attempted these things. They're just, they're perhaps, you know, reductive, you know, and, and it's, you're not getting the full picture of what's really going on. I mean, he does make great strides in explaining how societies end and great nations crumble, but I'm not, perhaps he shouldn't have called it fate of empires. He does say it is also relevant to great nation states. Um, but, you know, why hasn't, why hasn't uh, China collapsed by now? You know, it's been going far longer than 250 years. When, when's their age of decadence coming? Are they, are they in it now? Um, so yeah, I don't know. It, it's not it's not the be all and end all, but it is definitely worth a read. And it's such a quick read, isn't it? It's like thirty pages. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very influential in in our circles. So yeah, it's, and it's great, I, I think. think that uh, the best uh, it is one of the best because um, there, there's a there's a concept in NRX titled uh, cyc cyclical history. Uh, it, it's contrary to the vision of Whig history, which is held by leftists that um, you know a, as history goes on, you're kind of progressing towards a more uh, free, more equal, better society. So like, you know, they'll argue that things like, uh, you know, first universal suffrage and then, you know, abortion and, I don't know, gay marriage and stuff. That's like, they argue that that's history progressing towards more uh, freedom, equality, and a better society. Whereas uh, the, the, the narrative of cycl cyclical history is that it goes through kind of the cycles that uh, Glob identifies that you know, uh, there will be a, a nation state or an empire that kind of rises at one point and then eventually declines. And and what leftists consider progress is really, uh, that's really can uh, kind of a cancer. And that's actually the framework of the, civ the civilization falling apart. And um, sure. the, the other thing I thought was interesting, though, is that um, I, I originally attributed a lot of uh, the, a lot of the problems with the West today to liberalism and to the enlightenment and to extent by the, the extension uh progressivism but i mean i don't know if that's entirely true i mean i stand by the criticisms i've made about it but i've made about uh liberalism but um i think that it might be more due to uh it, it might be more due to psychological reasons because um like for example the arab empire of baghdad and if, uh for anyone that doesn't know what glob talks about is in the ninth century uh, the Arab Empire was the, I believe, the richest empire in the world, and eventually, what happened in Baghdad was that um, there was an influx of foreigners. So there were Persians, Egyptians, uh, um, and people from all around, Armenians, Greeks, so forth, uh, entering the uh, Baghdad that used to be entirely Arab. And what he also points out is that um, that there was a real decline in religion. There was a loss of morality, and that. Uh, he, he even talks about like how there was these, um, uh, there were these kind of pop stars at the time that would play these, uh, sexually provocative songs and that there was actually even, uh, some, uh, there was even a feminist movement that, uh, women began to enter positions that were traditionally held by men. And the thing that I thought was really fascinating was this all took place under Islam. So Islam became progressive under uh, in during the Arab Empire of Baghdad, and I thought, you know, it, it might not actually be the ideology as much as it is the uh, kind of the factors inside people that, uh, as they become more wealthy and more um, accustomed to that, that they eventually kind of their, their social framework kind of falls apart, and progressivism today might be the modern uh, manifestation of that. Yeah, perhaps it's just something that a. Uh always rears its ugly heads. It is interesting though that he, he identifies, you know, huge welfare states, um, multiculturalism, and uh, you know, it's just going too far with intellectualism. Everybody's got an opinion, everybody's over educated, everybody's arguing constantly. And I think, I think that uh, democracies definitely amplify that, don't they, when everybody's got their, their voice and their right to vote. And so they're just, we're constantly squabbling. I mean, you look at what's going on in England at the moment. This is not a united, uh, cohesive society anymore. People are uh, at each other's throats over Brexit. And I suppose you've seen the news today. We're actually having a vote coming up on whether we'll have another referendum or we're going to extend Article 50. So everybody's got a bloody opinion. And no, no one really knows. No one... You know, the, the, 
although everyone's got an opinion and, and they they're just borrowing from experts and they're borrowing you know they've been told but so you just got this this sort of industrialization of a chattering class it just constant opinion and disagreement and glob one of the things i think one of the sort of salient points for me is he said you know debate rarely ends in agreement right when people are debating with one another usually uh, maybe maybe you'll sway someone but that will take you know a year or two for them to come around to your way of seeing things right i mean perhaps we've all had a friend in our lives who thought we were nuts and then they were red pilled after a few years or, or whatever but usually it just it just makes you hate one another if you get into a Facebook argument with someone, like <laughs> you're not gonna, oh yeah, you know what? I, I totally agree with you now. Hey, let's go for beers. No, you, you it, it exacerbates the tensions. It, 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 it sort of uh, the debate leads to further conflict, and and um, it makes you dislike one another. You know, and people lose their temper, and and so he says, you know, when you whenever you've got whatever it is you're trying to do, uh, you know, whether it's build a society or run the the ladies' luncheon club. You have to have uh, self-sacrifice. You have to have people willing to give up their time, give up their interests for the greater good of the project, right? To to basically have a sense of duty. And I think that that seems to be the case whenever you see a society uh, crumbling. People have lost that sense of duty, and they've lost that spirit of self-sacrifice, and they they begin to put you know their very selfish needs before. Or, or just the, or just their whims, you know, and their tastes before the greater good, and they don't even see themselves as part of a project. They see themselves as just a pure individual going for a free ride, and they want that ride to be as easy as possible for them. And that's the the sort of outlook. And I see this all the time, all the time in England from my friends, people I know. Just this very like it's sort of an intellectualized selfishness. They justify it with arguments about individuality and things and you think no one takes a civilizational view no one takes a view that you've got to be duty bound to the group and that you know without that group doing well you're fucked as well so it is in your best interest to to ultimately sacrifice something for them um but that 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 you know it does seem to be in very short supply these days yeah, uh, one thing that was interesting that he pointed out was that uh, what what he called decadence, it's not necessarily wealth, it's the prolonged uh, accustomment to wealth and prolonged accustomment to that uh, really sense of uh, security. Because uh, the example he used was that in 1914, uh, there were in Britain and across Europe, the these really wealthy young men who would have had everything they ever could have wanted in life, uh, but they were also willing to go off and fight in the trenches because they really had a sense of duty towards uh, their empire that they that they built and or that they were a part of and uh, the society at the time really had a, a way of instilling that into young men and today though we don't really have that because people have just been so accustomed to it for so long I mean one thing I often think is that you know with the, with uh, the boomers for example uh, they've they were born after world war ii so they didn't expect they, they didn't experience the um the great depression or anything like that and uh there really hasn't been like this civilizational threat to um to the west for quite some time now and you know i i just feel like like the, the these the generations since world war ii really haven't kind of lost that sense that uh we really need to defend uh, Western civilization and yeah well, well how often do you hear sorry to butt in but how oh, yeah, often do you hear that this this gets my goat how often do you hear them saying well I'll be dead by then you know you lay out like hey we're facing a fucking civilizational crisis here buddy you know we're being at least in Europe we're being invaded by hordes of, of Muslims I mean this is this is just uh, the the political class allowing us to be invaded and and you know you lay it out or whatever and, and then they'll just go well I'll be dead by then You've heard people say this, right? It's it really. I find it a particularly disgusting attitude. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I hear it quite I have, frequently. Yeah, yeah. No, I no, just... I, yeah I've, I've I've heard uh, people say I've been dead by then. I, you know, I just think like you know, uh, if for anyone who doesn't know, I, I live in Canada, but I think like was what well, you know in 1867. You know, the, the the fathers of Confederation in Canada, they weren't they weren't like 
creating this country that's going to like, you know, be nice to them for their last 20 years of their life. You know, they were hoping that it would be something that would exist forever that they could give to their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren. And I mean, it was meant to be a essentially an extension of uh, of the British Empire. It was meant to be a Anglo-Saxon Christian uh, European nation. And it, it was something that required this long sighted um, uh, commitment to that went way beyond your own lifetime. Right. And it required a very, you know, he, he talks about it at the, at the beginning when these empires and these great nations emerge, right? You have complete social cohesion with a very strong sense of identity. Um, it's, you know, they're typically ethnically and religiously homogenous, so that's easier to foster, but they have a shared goal in mind. And then once the affluence comes in and everybody's bloody rich and just going off doing their own thing and 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 the decadence then comes you know shortly thereafter with the bread and circuses you lose that sense of cohesion and everyone is confused you know what what is our national character who are we what what does it even mean to be british what is it you know i have friends tell me that they don't feel english they don't know what that even means there was um an article that, that recently really pissed me off from the guardian talking about how British values just aren't even on a thing, right? And I, I get it that it's very hard to define these things, um, but I, I, I still think that they're there. You know, we're a people with a character and a certain outlook, and, and that exists. And yes, we can analyze it and, and whatever, we could put it on graphs, you know, but uh, the fact that no, it's not salient in, in, the, in the population at all, they don't know what these values are supposed to be. No one's told them, or, or if they are told, it's just, we're tolerant, you know, which is one of those sort of very, it, it almost, it just raises more questions, doesn't it? Like, well, that's who we are. We're just tolerant. We just bend over backwards for people. That's our character. You know, this uh, confusion, I think, and this lack of identity really is a great weakness. Um, it makes your people incredibly weak if they can't rally behind a flag or behind an identity and feel unified together. Otherwise, they're just, you know, they're fractured and I don't know, what's the what's the metaphor about a bunch of sticks together or whatever? <laughs> I don't remember it, but <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the, the metaphor is, uh, you know, the, it's actually the, the fasci. That, that's what the uh, symbol of um, the, the, the fasces, which was a Roman symbol, but it was used by uh, Benito Mussolini. It's that one stick is easy to break, but when you get a bundle of sticks together, uh, they're supposed to be unbreakable. Uh, but I mean, yes. I think that you can't, for a lot of people, you can't even really blame them, though, because there, I find that like the sense of uh, the sense of duty and the sense of uh, of togetherness that's something that you really can only derive from a wider society. And it's like, uh, for uh, for example, I mean, the city that I'm from, it's a multicultural city now. I mean, it's 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 uh, I'm from Toronto, but uh, I've recently left. But um, it's similar to to the way London would be today. And that I mean, th there's just been such an influx of foreigners, and then. There's, there's just been such a long period of consumerism and uh, really this dead generation that it's very difficult to derive really any kind of uh, cohesive identity out of it. Even even if uh, even even if you're you're conscious of your own national and ethnic uh, identity, it's very hard to derive that from a, a civilization that's really lost that. Yes, well, I mean, it's not fostered in our youth, is it? So it's it's just not there. It's not encouraged, and I think that. A lot of people now they think that patriotism is is archaic, right? It, it's um so passe, and it's just like, oh, what are you, you old fart? You know, thinking that your country's special, like. And there's always um these silly arguments, like if you feel proud of your nation or something, that you're somehow claiming all the achievements of the greatest people it's produced, uh, which is of course nonsense. You know, it's not what you're doing at all. You're proud because. Uh, you know, you're proud of it because you want it to be better and you want to, you know, if you don't take pride in something, it'll it'll erode and, and rot. Uh, that's why a sense of national pride is healthy, not hubris, not arrogance, but just very healthy, straightforward. We love this thing. We want to preserve it. Therefore, we take pride in it. Um, and that that is seen as, um, I think a lot of people genuinely have, have kind of been convinced that that's oppressive. And that that's um, not just closed-mindedness, 
but it's actually dangerous, right? They'll they'll just point to Hitler or something and go, well, he was proud of his country too. Look what <laughs> happened there. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, mate, you know, you know, it's it's very silly, but I don't know, people buy into these arguments because no one's taught them any different. Um and, and certainly our at the public institutions in England, I imagine in Canada it's just as bad. Uh try to portray patriotism as just being something that that is um really only embraced by uneducated working class thugs and and that you don't want to be an uneducated working class thug do you you know us sophisticates the the sophisticated people um who are on tv us intellectuals we 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 uh we've we've moved on we've moved past that barbarity yeah, and that's I that's actually part of uh that was actually part of Glob's essay that what he said was that there is, is a yeah. phase there's a phase where people in a great power that they have the sense that uh they've made it and that they're kind of past the conquest that really gave them what the, what they uh you know gave them all the wealth that they have to begin with and then they begin to have this self doubt and they begin to kind of look back on their ancestors because they you know they didn't go through the same struggles and say well you know they were kind of they were barbaric or they were um uh and the, kind of looking back at their past endeavors as uh unjust and you know i think this is really where cultural marxism comes from today because uh it, it's really like looking back at the rise of of the west over the last 500 years or so and from the from people who are reaping the benefits of that yet didn't really put in the work it's easy to to look back and say well they were you know racist or they were oppressive and stuff but it really fails to understand the uh what's really required in order to bring that about because i mean for example if in if you know in 1800 had they had this policy that you know we're gonna uh that 50 percent of our, our workforce is going to be female and you know we're going to promote black women and you know, transgender children and stuff like that. I mean, let's be honest here. the The West would probably <laughs> would have would have probably been invaded by Islam back then. Yes, yes. Oh, that we never would have got on the Crusades if we were of the same mindset. We would never have defended our lands. Yeah, or helped out our European brothers back then. You know, it would have been well. They they probably deserve to be invaded because we're so full of guilt. We're so guilt ridden. <laughs> and thinking of this um. This past, you know, judging people by the standards of today, historical figures is obviously a big one. They're trying to tear down the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oxford. There's a whole movement called Rhodes Must Fall. It was in the news maybe sort of two and a half, three years ago, back when I started my channel. Uh, but they're still around, you know, all these um, black and brown uh, students sort of uh, championing this movement who come in quite often on Rhodes scholarships. So you, you know who Cecil Rhodes is, right? Yes, the, uh, I do. Famous, yeah, okay, of course, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, just, um, uh, but yeah, so uh, I, I assume people in the, you know, who watch us know who he is as well. Pretty famous dude. Anyway, but they come in on road scholarships and then they trash him and they go, it's awful. And I'm using that money to fight, you know, to decolonize Oxford and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and when it comes to the other thing with looking at the past is this, now we have like, uh, how can I put this, retroactive, um judgment i suppose like a you know retroactive politically correct sentencing of people so tucker he tucker carlson is in trouble at the moment right because in 2000 the year 2000 19 years ago he goes on the radio and it's um a shock jock who he's speaking with and he says some pretty provocative things but they're he's being funny you know, and, and all of all of the things that have been taken out from from what he said as well are all removed from context. So he said something about Iraqis being barbarians or something like that, and not not washing their asses properly. But he also said that they have a right to sovereignty and that we shouldn't have invaded their country and that the war's disgusting and wrong and immoral. You know, but he was saying this other thing to to get a laugh right from the audience. But this is nineteen years old. And he's being judged by today's standards of political correctness, which have really ramped up just even since 2010. Oh, yeah, because, uh, you, you know, there, there's the kind of uh, the tendency to look back. I mean, it is that kind of tendency to look back on your past and, and then uh, ascribe to it the uh, like, cause I don't like to say uh, don't judge the past by today's morality because I reject I, re I, I, I unilaterally reject the morality that we're given today. But um, I say. Too. 
I say reject. I don't. I say don't judge the past by today's technology because I, I I'm of the belief that you know humans are. Uh, I, I'm of the belief that humans are generally just very vicious creatures, and that um, it's really techno technology and uh, abundance of wealth that makes them less violent because they're not. It doesn't require them to be as violent to go uh, to uh, satisfy their basic needs. So you know, someone in uh, in say 1600, uh, it, it was probably necessary for them to to you know in what to enlarge their their empire and to, and to really. Uh, become a successful country. They need to go off. They need to go, uh, and then they often fought with you know African tribes or you know or or whatever they enslaved people and stuff. It's like yeah, we're not saying do that today. But the thing is, back then they needed to be a lot more brutal to survive. And you, you see, like uh, an analogy that one of my buddies uh, said was that um, the le leftists kind of view history as if. There was this evil white man with a with a pile of money behind a curtain, just uh, smiling as he was keeping it from everyone else. And had he just given them all that money, um, th then all for all of history, we, we would have had like flying cars, uh, universal health care, yeah. and yeah, know, what kind of like, <laughs> yes, yeah, what kind of would have been real, right? If it weren't for <laughs> the evil white man, <laughs> yeah. um, they think they think also that just civilization just pops out of thin air, it's just the. There's no explanation for why uh, we either stole, right? Of course, we stole. That helped us. We didn't invent anything. Uh, we had no geniuses. We just stole everything from Africans, right? Africans invented maths and stuff, and uh, the Arabs invented paper and and, and uh, whatever. I mean, you know, it's all nonsense. So, <laughs> but the um, the Whig view you were talking about earlier, the Whig view of history. Uh, it really does ensure this perspective, doesn't it? Because if you're always marching towards progress, part of that has to be purging yourself of, of sin, right? And, and, and sort of cleansing society and sanitizing it. So you've got to shame the history that you're moving away from. You've got to ensure that that is viewed as an evil past because we're marching towards this bright future. Um, the cyclical view doesn't see it like that at, at, at all, though, and it ensures a more conservative approach right where you you want to make sure this doesn't crumble you realize things were bloody hard to build and you know it can be over in a heartbeat it, i think you look at something like say like the soviet union which seems so powerful and and so ever present for people who were living during the cold war i mean i i wasn't alive then but um i was alive but not politically conscious i was like four when the Berlin wall came down uh maybe younger. And, uh, you know, but people then, you know, they were hiding under their desks doing drills if they get nuked by, by Russia. And this is an incredibly powerful force. And I think the Soviet Union ended in something like 32 minutes. It's something like that. It's a very, it just suddenly, it was, it was over. There was a, some, something signed and that was it, D done. This huge mammoth giant that was holding the whole world at gunpoint. Uh, just collapsed in a second. A any, I, I do think this is not you. You know, obviously the Soviet Union was on an accelerated track because they were pursuing such wacky economic policies and just treating their own citizens like, you know, like less than human. Um, but so this accelerated their decline. But I do still think that any civilization, if they lose track, it can end like that. It can just crumble. Yeah, and. and you know, there was no, no one in 1980 would have thought that, you know, uh, Eastern Europe was going to, uh, communism was going to die in Eastern Europe, uh, within the next 10 years. And, you know, um, there is also the sense that, uh, when an empire is at its height, that, uh, it's going to be like that forever. You know, uh, there was this, there was a saying like, you know, the sun never sets on the British empire because the sun, you know, there was always a part of the empire that the sun was up in, uh, or, and you know, there was, uh, the sense that Rome was going to rule the world forever. And basically every uh, major power has always had the idea that it was always going to be like that. Once that, once they got good and once they got accustomed to that, they've always had the idea that that was permanent. And I, I think that, mm -hmm. it, you know, an example of that today would be Francis Fukuyama. I don't know if you've read the end of history. Um, I haven't read it, but I'm aware of it. Yes. Oh, the uh, the idea that awful. we're all going to become liberal democracies, right? So yeah. He's a neocon hero, right? Yeah, basically like he, he claimed that, uh, in 1992, after the fall of communism, that uh, basically history was going to end because um, <laughs> liberal democracy was going to make everyone uh, super wealthy and you know uh, 
we would be satisfied for all time with, you know, N64 games and uh, the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> but um, yeah. I'd say that in the present day, the best example of kind of an empire in decline is America. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm very worried about America. And um, so are my American friends. A lot, a lot of them feel like um, uh, it's basically going to split up, um, maybe on ethnic lines, but also uh, religious, cultural lines, um, that it's just uh, an unsustainable project at this point. Yeah, and it's really undergone that that 250 year cycle. Like you know, America started out, and I mean, it started out as a, a pioneering country. It was you know a, a couple colonies uh, of English settlers, and uh, yeah, eventually expanded across um, the uh, North American continent. And uh, and you know, as it was on its rise, there was a real sense of uh, frontiersmanship. And you know, I get the I get the sense from you know American men in the 19th century that you know they were really part they were really you know creating this uh, creating something great. And eventually they did. And you know the and I find around I'd say the height was probably around the 1950s. I mean, at that point, there a lot of people probably would have had the feeling that. You know, they have it the best that they've ever had it. Then that uh, I think it was millennial woes that had said that um, uh, in the 1950s, Americans must have just ha had this feeling that, you know, they have the they have life the best that it's ever been. And that, you know, they would have had like this sense of confidence for their children, their grandchildren and so on. And I mean, that's really kind of died, died off over the last 50 years. And it, it's undergone all pretty much all the same, uh, uh, the all the uh, symptoms that that club points to. For example, here were here were some of the examples of use. So, influx of foreigners, check. Decline of religion, check. Loss of uh, sexual morality, materialism, reversal of the genders, uh, obsession with sports. He says that one thing he says is that um, in a, in its dying days, uh, the heroes will go from being you know the the conquerors, the generals, the great statesmen. The heroes will become the singers, the actors, the athletes, the celebrities, really. And, and the intellectuals. Sorry? And the intellectuals. Yeah. Uh, and the intellectuals also become celebrities, right? And superstars. And, yeah. and I mean, go, go on. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, but I mean, I, when I look at something like, say, the Kavanaugh hearing or the Covington Catholic scandal, I mean, the sense that I really got from those is that, uh, and, you know, you can, you can really apply this to other countries too, but uh, there really was no American people. It was really just people fighting over for power over America because. You know, just the amount of viciousness that they were at each other's throats at with, you know, that's that's something that you don't see from a cohesive society. Yeah, you know the the, um, the meme, right? The what is it? Hard men like like uh, soft men create hard times, and hard times create. I can't remember how it has it. Go? Yeah. Uh, it goes, um, strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times create strong men. Yeah, this is like the the American America in sort of a nutshell. You look at something like the uh, California Gold Rush, right? Uh, eighteen forty eight, I think it started, and it went on for about five, six years, something like that. And you know, three hundred thousand people just crossing America from, you know, from one side of the country to another, often dying on this journey. It's an incredibly tough journey, being attacked by uh, Native Americans, or or indeed just being attacked by highwaymen and thugs and rapists and bandits and it was so dangerous and so bloody lawless and these people work i mean their work ethic was extraordinary they walk into the wilderness to find their fortune to build cities to build towns it's incredible it's incredible what they achieved and what these people went through and they're all they're all dying you know at the age sort of between like 40 to 55 or whatever i don't know what the average lifespan was back then but not very high. A lot of kids dying. A lot of women dying in uh, childbirth, and, and still they just strode ahead. You know, they strode on. They built the greatest nation of all time. And now the population that currently occupy it just seems to want to give it away. They're obsessed with philanthropy, and and especially philanthropy towards foreigners, which Glob talks about. Right? It, it it this is this is a trait of a of a society or a great nation in decline that they want to bestow their greatest honors on immigrants and they want to promote these people and they want to transfer their wealth and and because they look back on their past as something to feel ashamed of they feel that their wealth is ill-gotten and must be shared um 
so they just give it all away you know it's ah oh, it's just but it it really frustrates me but but he's definitely right on this on the, the some of these points isn't he when you look at america it's a perfect example yeah definitely and you know i, I think that speaking of uh, california there was a great video by vertigo politics the fall of california have you seen that one I haven't, no. Oh, it, it, he did some excellent work, really talking about how the state of California was built, uh, you know, for, you know, starting off in, you know, the, of course it was originally Spanish, but uh, the gold rush days and, you know, just with uh, how hard men just went in and uh, really created this, what became this work, this uh, middle-class paradise. I mean, you know, it's warm weather and uh, Hollywood and all, and all this stuff. And it was, uh, of course, you know, none of us like Hollywood these days, but um, uh what he talked about was just how California really just became pretty much the best place to live uh, mm -hmm. for, for on earth. And over, and not only that, but it was a conservative state. Like uh, this was where, um, you know, people like Nixon or Reagan, this is where these guys were from. And uh, for a long time, California was actually a, a conservative haven and the influx of uh, Hispanics over the last 50 years, it, how it really just, just how California really just fell apart and just with the, the policy changes and how it went from being, uh, you know, a, a conservative state to a, a, well, I mean, I guess you could say a quasi socialist one, like it's a, a, a solid blue uh, constantly. And that's really due to Hispanic voting, but uh, you really yeah. kind of just see the, just the collapse of the American dream starting in California and, yeah, for anyone that that that's interested, that that is a very good video on it. Vertigo politics, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I've only watched maybe one of his videos. I, I'm not that familiar with that channel, but I shall check it out. Yeah. Um, it, what do you think about um, this idea that affluence is basically bad for the national psyche? Do you buy into that? So uh, yeah, I mean. It, it, it's it's difficult because I I find that when a w when a power is becomes wealthy I don't think it, it starts to die right away because um when you when you look at at, at you know the late nineteenth century for example uh, Europe was extremely wealthy and they were actually putting that money towards things like architecture art uh, and then good education where they actually you know instilled that sense of of duty amongst in within men and that I find I find that you know what, what, once you kind of lose the uh, the sense of work that you associate with that I find that's when it really becomes a problem. So yes. it, it, the problem becomes when when it when it switches from being about a pursuit of something greater to just being the pursuit of just pure material wealth. So um, you, you know, uh, for example, when I think of uh, when I think of like say the nineteen eighties, uh, I think of um, someone like say Ronald Reagan. I don't get the same sense from uh, from the nineteen from nineteen eighties America that uh, they really had the same pioneering spirit. Like it seems to really they, they always talk about like you know the entrepreneur and stuff, and of course that was a huge part of it. But um, I don't get the I don't get the sense though that you know it was towards something greater. It seemed to be a lot more of a materialistic like uh, let's make my uh, I can make myself wealthy here, but not really contribute to something wider. Hmm. I think, you know, at, with affluence can come uh, 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 the removal of purpose, right? And without purpose, we're sort of lost. Because um, if you've got all your needs taken care of, what do you have to, what are you going to do? You know, you don't really, you don't have to do anything. You just say, you just sit around, you bum around, and you bum around, and you just bum it through life. Life's a DOS. That's what we, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that slang, DOS, like, you know, you just slack off forever, right? Uh, and yeah, I think it's so I think there is an element of truth to it. But also, I mean, as you were saying, great beauty can come from affluence as well. You look at, say, uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's absolutely stunning. And that was that was paid for by, you know, one of the wealthiest institutions in the world. So it, it's it's it, it's it, it's if you have affluence with decent values and you don't create a society which just and that, the, the idea with Glove, though, is obviously that it's it's just sort of inevitable. This will happen. You know, sorry, folks, that's the way it's going to go. Um, so, you know, you become affluent, then you do become uh, obsessive philanthropists and, and you build this unsustainable welfare state 
and everybody's on on it for a free ride and everyone's on the gravy train and it's all a laugh and then it collapses but it seems to me like you the amount of beauty that's been produced by affluent societies you know cultures that still harbor decent values decent a decent philosophical outlook if that's maintained i don't i don't necessarily I'm not going to just jump in with gloves and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what their ideology is. It doesn't matter what their uh, their outlook is. It doesn't matter how they structure their society. If they're rich, they're fucked. Which is sort of, it's sort of where he's coming from. He's just saying that that's the way it goes. Would you go that far? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't. I think that it is inevitable if you don't uh, if you don't take the right steps to uh, to prevent it. Like you know, if if there isn't this, uh, you know, if you're if you're not constantly stoking the flame of. Uh, of you know the drive to create you know civilizational greatness, I think yes, eventually it will uh, it will fall apart, and I think that that's clearly what's already happened to us today. I mean, I think I think like going forward, it's like um, what Glob argues is that you know you can avoid it if you study human history, and that you know if you study how these empires have fallen, you can take uh, steps to avoid that. And what he argues is that you know the steps to avoid that is to uh, is that you have to maintain that uh, that civilizational drive and you need to maintain that higher purpose and yes. it's something we've we've obviously haven't listened to him like he in uh he actually wrote a, a <laughs> response to uh to his essay um called this the fate the quest for survival uh have you read that one also no i haven't I, I wasn't aware it was out there actually yeah um and what he does it's him responding to letters uh that he received and uh, he 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 makes a lot of good points, but uh, obviously we didn't. No one listened to him. Uh, you know, he talked about uh, he talked about you know how uh, as the British Empire was falling, what they should have done was uh, hold on to seaports across the across the world, and that um, they that if American and British ships had had held on to the, like those important naval bases, you know, they, they could have they could have dominated uh, international waters, uh, you know, beyond that. But you know that the, the kind of the kind of anti-colonial uh, sentiment going around at the time uh, prevented them from doing that. And you know, um, the other thing he talked about interestingly was he said that um, he he said that it might be inevitable that uh, with the movement of people that you know uh, you might get an influx of foreigners in a, in a country. Not that it's he said that yes, it's best if it's uh, homogenous. But he said that it might happen. Uh, just due to uh, globalization, but what he said is that you should definitely avoid integration and keep and allow people to have homogenous communities, and that one we really failed on. Uh, but you know, I think that what I do think mean that, we really failed on it because uh, that sort of describes London, doesn't it? I mean, this area is Turkish, this area is Indian. Oh no, what no. Um, what I know, we failed. What we failed to do is keep uh, to keep people apart rather than integrate them, because what he what he says yeah. is that. What he says is that people should be allowed to have, uh, you know, their own communities, and that if you're going to have one, if you're going to have the, if this happens, the best way to deal with it is to not force people together and to not, uh, you know, try try to, you know, have this universalist one where you know you can just fit fit anyone into it, any uh, position in society. And you just need to educate them. And the example he uses is that in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, people often forget about this, but they had to integrate schools at gunpoint. Like it was not something that, yeah. uh, that that people did voluntarily, and it and it's completely failed. Like um, when you well, they're becoming less integrated now. You know this, right? They're they're less integrated than they have been since the seventies, um, which is quite incredible. So they're becoming more and more ethnically racially uh, homogenous as time goes on. It's just that is the way human beings behave. They like to get together with people like them and maintain dominance in that geographic region in which they dwell that's just uh and it seems it seems to me that that creates a more harmonious a more harmonious situation it reduces conflict so it seems like the right way to go but when i said this to my liberal mate the other day he just thought that i was absolutely wacky and some sort of white supremacist who hated everyone and i thought no you know we're talking about just trying to like get on with life here and, and leave people alone uh, the left cannot accept this view, though they they're very they're, they're real busybodies, aren't they? They want to you know you know you've got to you've got to you've got to date a trans person, you've got to <laughs> you've got to have a, a mixed race kid with some non-binary freak show, you know you've got to do that. Then then you've like passed the test or something. 
I mean, what a bizarre outlook. Just let yeah. people live where they want to live and then they won't fight one another, you know. Don't allow invasion and respect sovereignty. It's pretty pretty basic standard, uh, yeah. which I would afford to all people. Um, but yeah, with the, um, with the multicultural one, we obviously have a lot of conspiracies in our neck of the woods on the distant right as to why uh, the West has become multicultural. Uh, a lot of scheming groups, tricks, you know, turning uh, a, a lot of um, underhanded corruption and so on. And there's there's um, the Kalergi plan. And, you know, there's all these conspiracies, right? Whereas Glob is just like, it's the great way, wealth of your nation. And the fact that you guys have lost your, your will and your strength that allows this situation to occur. And I have to say, I'm quite tempted by that view. I've never really been that conspiratorial. Well, what do you make of this? So do you think it's, when you're rich, if you're not if you're not highly nationalistic, you're basically just going to inevitably become multicultural. Yeah, I do. I do think that there always is going to be kind of this uh, influx of foreigners that c comes with wealth. When when the, you know uh, an African sees uh, Europe, he wants he wants in on that wealth. Though I mean, what you can you can look at a lot of the policies that it, it, there is a very clear attempt to make the West more, more multicultural right now with obviously the immigration policies. But I mean, the, another one that I've actually looked at is that um, if you look at some of the places that they place refugees, like for example, uh, in Canada, they placed uh, a lot of Syrian refugees in Fredericton, which was a, like a pretty much like a 95% white city. Um, uh, or <clears throat> they even placed uh, Somalis in Maine, which was the whitest state in the United States. <clears throat> Sorry, one sec. <clears throat> But didn't that result in all sorts of diseases arriving in Maine? I seem to remember reading about that. Uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't hear about that. But um, you know, I think there are definitely policies in place that you know. I, I mean, I guess it's, I guess you could argue that um, they're trying to really deal with it uh, because I guess you know, if the, if we've already become multicultural, you you could argue that they're really trying to make that work. Which of course we know it's not going to work. But um, yes. Yeah, it's definitely the it's definitely the wealth that attracts people into into the West because you know no uh, I mean no Muslim is going to Britain because he wants to you know be a be an Englishman. He's going there because he wants the benefit. He wants to be a Muslim who benefits off the welfare state, really. Yeah, and he hopes that he'll be able to convert English people to Islam and uh, basically turn our country into you know the new caliphate, the rich the richest caliphate of them all. Um, uh, which which they they even admit to you know they just say oh, that's that's basically what we want i don't want anything more than that there's a, there's uh, an interview with the head of britain first are you aware of this group yeah they, i know them. they call themselves a political party but yeah very bad optics but i mean you know just i think they're pretty ordinary people to be honest anyway uh the leader is um interviewing this uh, this muslim and he goes you know, you want you want to turn this country into an Islamic country, right? And the guy's just like, yeah, inshallah, get me, like, I totally want that. Like, really <laughs> and truly, like, you know, inshallah, Muhammad, yeah, that's what I want. And and he just goes, at the end of the interview, this chap just goes, you know, just sit back and watch, yeah, because it's going to happen. Enjoy it. And it, oh, it boils the blood to watch it. But, you know, this is... This is reality. Uh, perhaps not all Muslims are so politically minded, but I think a fair few of them are. And they definitely, uh, they couldn't integrate even if they wanted to. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these fallacies, isn't it? They, you know, fit in or fuck off. You've heard that line? Yeah. Australians always use it. Just oh, fit in or fuck off, mate. You, know, you don't like it, you just fuck off. It's, they're not going to integrate, okay? Stop being silly. You know, if you went to live in Japan, would you stop being Australian? Would you stop being Canadian? It cannot. It, it it's such a fantasy that um, really trying to trying to change someone's mind on that as well. The sort of boomer conservatives who who are patriots and and quite nationalistic. Um, you try and tell them no. Not not anyone can just move to your country and become like you. It's they've never seemed to have even considered this this view, and and they think it's racist. You know, so they they don't like it. Well, yeah, I mean, not only what you, I mean, for example, if you move to Japan, it doesn't matter how hard you try to be Japanese, even if like you spend your entire, uh, even if you spend your entire day trying to be as Japanese as possible, they're still going to look at you and think you're not Japanese. So, I mean, uh, yeah. And, and not only that, but it, like in America, for example, uh, the kind of the civic nationalism, the American patriotism, uh, that's something that's like 
95% white. I mean, there's very few, um, uh, there's very few, I guess you could say, non-white civic nationalists. Yeah, just a coincidence, mate. Just a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, it's it's from the that they 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 really can't fundamentally can't identify with with that um w with that nation state. And I even made a, a video about the brands of the left and the right. And the, one of the reasons that you know I I think that the right is you know pretty much it, it's overwhelmingly white, while whilst the left is extremely diverse, is that um. You know, the right really is selling like uh, a European civilization, and that's and that really ap appeals to those who really are derived from it. I, I think you had even talked about uh, about Hispanics in uh, in the United States who send their bodies back to Mexico after they die. Yes, they do. Yeah, thousands uh, per year. They want to be buried in in the motherland um, or whatever they call it. I guess they got a name uh, for their country that they use. You know, but they want to be in that dirt. Um, and it shows that, you know, this is after some of them, you know, they've been there 50 years and they still want their body um, to be buried where they're from. It's it's an interesting tradition. And of course, you see them uh, cheering for the Mexican football team uh, for if, if any Mexican uh, club teams even come over and sort of play against you know, LA Galaxy or something. They're, they're always cheering for the Mexicans. And I don't know, it, it's it's it's. It, to me, it, it looks like invasion and it looks like really arrogant sort of behavior. But I suppose, you know, it's, it's, it's really just uh, you're, you're sort of, you're pissing in your ho host's home. You know what I mean? You're just pissing on the floor of, of your host and really rubbing their face in it. That, you know, hey, fuck you. I don't even want, I don't even like this place. You know, <laughs> I don't even want to be buried here. Like, fuck you. Um, but what can we expect? It seems to be human nature. Yeah, um, I, I think the biggest tragedy, though, is that we accept it because, you know, had they tried this 100 years ago, they would have been they would have been uh, removed from the land pretty instantaneously. And, uh, yeah, I think it's really just a, a testament to how uh, how cocked we've really become that, you know, someone can just like, for example, when I was at university, uh, this I had this Muslim guy who I think moved to Canada like only two years before talking about decolonization. And I'm like, you you you're not part of this country, dude. You're you're not Canadian. You, you have no tie to the history whatsoever. Yet you're telling me in my in the land that my grandparents built that we need to decolonize it, that we need to tear down, uh, you know, our culture. I'm like, and you know, it, I think that it's really it's just a testament to how, uh, yeah, how soft we've become because you yeah, know, no one we can't tell all these people just to fuck off. Like, I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious to me. Just, you know, oh, you don't like it. Like these kids I was talking about in Oxford that want to tear down statues of, of white racists and stuff. I mean, they, they're not just going after Cecil Rhodes. It's, it's a bunch of statues that they've got on their hit list. They want to decolonize the campus. It's like, why the fuck did you come from your, you know, your black country, right, in Africa? Why did you come from there and come here and tell us to do this? And, and we're just expected to be polite and engage them in debate. I mean, it's, no, this, these people, got, they're fucking entitled. You know, the entitlement is sickening. And of course, like you say, we let them get away with it. We just, we just, we're so weak, you know. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, the question is like, how, how much longer can this, the state really go on? Because, uh, you know, I, I tend to think that the kind of the situation can really only last about another 10, 20 years. But uh, at the same time, I, I often ask myself, am I incorrect? Because like, could it go on for another 100 years? Because, you know, um, it, it certainly is in that kind of we certainly are in that age of uh, age of decadence and really the dying days of kind of the of, of the west as it as it is and i do think that i wouldn't say i'm black belt because i do think that there there's going to be something that comes after that but I, I just wonder like how much longer can we go on before there's major change yeah it's, it's something i struggle with man because I, I i was of the mind that war was just imminent uh maybe a year and a half ago i was just thinking it's gonna kick off we had our first um retaliatory attack that was successfully carried out a lot of others have you know, every year they stop and think about, you know, four or five um, what they deem far right extremist uh, terrorist plots in England. They get foiled. But that bloke with his van, Darren uh, Wilson or Watson, I forget the surname, but Darren something. Um, he was a bit, you know, funny in the head, had uh, emotional problems. Uh, I think he had a psychiatrist and stuff. 
he rented a van and he ran over a bunch of Muslims with it. You probably remember this story. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, so it, 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 everything seemed very volatile. And, you know, we had the Manchester attack, which was huge because that was, you know, really young children that got killed. Um, it was it was a fucking, it wasn't Rihanna, but it was one of those singers. Um, oh, what's her name? Whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Grande, Ariana Grande, I think. And so all the, all the people watching this concert were, you know, little kids getting blown up. And then we saw arguments on the streets of Manchester and the uh, people going, you know, you's right, you're fucking Muslims and all this, you know, yelling at each other. And, you know, the Manx are quite tough. That's up north. They're, they're not as politically correct as people are down south or in, in cosmopolitan centre like London. You know, they're, 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 they'll happily fight if you, if you step on their toes. Lovely people, but yeah, this, this was like their children being murdered. Uh, you know, if you'd fucking killed my daughter, I'd fucking kill you. This guy was yelling at a Muslim like this. Uh, the cops were on TV saying, please, you don't retaliate. Um, the, uh, we have to bear in mind that the Muslim community feel under threat at the moment. Oh, they said, oh, of course. You know? they're, they're the victims. <laughs> yeah. Yes. After we've been blown up, they're the ones that feel, you know, they feel in danger. So let's not stoke any tensions. And I was sort of drawn to the the image that uh, Enoch Powell evoked when he talks about a nation busily stacking its own funeral pyre or something. Uh, I can't remember the exact words, but you did, you just got this it, this this nation engaged in such insanity, and it's just it, you just they're just pouring you know gasoline onto the the the, the pile of wood, and you just you know one spark, it's all going to kick off, and it really felt like that. It really, I got this feeling, but then it just kind of people just carried on, you know, people just carried on and we've had more attacks since then. And we've had more right wing uh, groups, you know, trying to trying to kill Muslims and, and, um, and they've been foiled, you know, these attacks have been foiled. It just, it just kind of keeps going on with people going about their business, getting worse and worse every day. So I don't know, there's a couple of options here, isn't there? There's either the war, the collapse, there's the maybe a peaceful collapse, you know, like the Soviet Union or something. It just, it just, we go bankrupt and, and the immigrants uh, leave because, you know, why would they stay in, in a, a state that they can't suck the teeth on it, of anymore? And then there's, then there's the horrific one that it, we just decline and we are eventually demographically replaced and our civilization is snuffed out. Sort of, you know, the, the, the candle just burns out. And that, that's the one that's just terrifying. But yeah, I, I yeah. think it's, it's a possibility, isn't it? If it weren't a possibility, what are we doing campaigning? What are we doing making videos? We know that that's a possibility. It must must be there. And, and I am white-pilled, but it, we have to rem remember what's at stake. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that... Um... The reason that I don't think that I, I don't think that's going to happen is because I, I mean I have a hard time believing that you know European men are just going to uh, you know go on go on with uh, with this forever and that you know like they're just going to sit stand by as you know their civilization is stolen from them. I don't think that uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But at the same time, I don't think that there's going to be like this one event that solves everything. So uh, I don't think that there's going to be like a revolution or anything like that. So you know I think. That uh, and also, I don't think that there's going to be like a, a one day we wake up and the entire thing collapses. What I think is going to happen is it's going to be like a a um, gradual decline because I think we're already in that. Um, the but, collapse could be economic, though, couldn't it? You know, yeah, uh, I mean, financial collapses happen overnight because suddenly the, the markets spurg out, and that's it. It's done. You know, confidence is gone, and uh, and thousands of people uh, are just laid off like over the next few days and just get, and it, then it ex escalates so that was my thinking of the collapse but anyway go on sorry well yeah um i mean i though I, th I think though that you know what he even talks about in the essay is that a, a new power always comes out of uh out of somewhere that is unexpected so like there'll be a small nation that'll eventually start building and you know i i definitely think that um i de i definitely think that you know, in the future, at some point, there is going to be a resurgence of Western civilization. I think the the thing I really question though is how far away is that? Like, you know, I guess the one thing that would depress me is like, you know, is if that like comes, but I, after uh, after you know our own lifetimes, you know. So I, I do think that I do yeah. think that it's important for people not to give up hope because, um, you know, I, I do think I do find that like kind of the support for multiculturalism, it's probably a lot 
uh, weaker than we might think. Like, you know, a white liberal can can say, you know, diversity is our strength all they want behind a um, a gated community. They can uh, call for, you know, refugees welcome. But, you know, what? once it actually begins to affect them, I mean, that's a lot harder of a sell. I mean, I don't think that people are going to be, uh, you know, following this like suicidal uh, cult of, you know, multiculturalism and egalitarianism, really. I don't think people are going to follow that to their very deaths. So I think that they'll, pro they'll probably follow that until it becomes a lot less comfortable. And I think we're already starting to see that. And now the other, the other thing is that um, it, you can also tell that, that, that uh, the powers that be are really kind of concerned with the rise of nationalism in Europe. And then uh, even in North America these days that um, th they're trying to snuff it out early because I think they know the threat that it really poses. So um, I, I tend to think that the situation is quite volatile. Yes. Well, there's a couple of things to, to respond to here. Um, the hard time believing that European men will just allow this. Um, I think I think there's a lot of truth to that. The, now, I mean, let's say you're on board with the, the as you say, the suicidal cult of multiculturalism or, or however you put it. Um, the left is now just so hostile to white men that they are, that, that our side is just growing uh, very naturally because of that. Um, I read an article the other day about Bernie bros and how this was in the New York Times and it was just absolutely shitting on these people, you know? So these guys are trying to be as left wing as possible. They're politically correct. They want a socialist Jew to be the president of the United States. Um, you know, how much more politically correct does it get? You know what I mean? And, and <laughs> they are being shat on and told that they're assholes and that they're ruining, they're ruining the left and, and no, no one wants them. You know, there's, there's no, there's no home for the white man on the left. They're despised. Uh, they're seen as, as the root of all problems. They're not allowed to speak in meetings. They're not allowed to contribute. If they see, if they feel that there's a purpose for them over there to help the less fortunate, and they, you know, they're genuine like that. They have empathy for minorities. Uh, they they want to help the underdog. Okay. Well, how are they going to fulfill this purpose when there's the progressive stack in, 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 enacted in, in meetings? They're told to be quiet. They're told not to give their opinion. They're told to stop man spreading and man splaining and all of this shit. <laughs> it's it's like you know you're not going to get any uh, emotional fulfillment from being involved in such a political project as a white male. So they're obviously going to start drifting towards us, and that's definitely that's definitely uh, reason to to have some hope because I do see our side as as being in you know in a period of growth. And although, you know, we, we've got an uphill battle, we're heading in the right direction. Whereas the left seem to be really losing grip of, of their hold over the, the narrative and over contemporary wisdom. You know, fucking no one believes the media anymore. Uh, people are very distrustful of, of academic institutions, which of course is riddled with Marxists. Uh, so, you know, things, the arrow seems to be pointing towards it, it going in our direction. But let's just say, even if there is no hope, Right, there's just none. It's all it's all fucked. We're fucked, guys. <laughs> you know, there's still there's still no dignity in being a cuck. There's there's no dignity to it. You got to go out fighting. You know, I mean, uh, it, it 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 makes no sense whatsoever to live as a coward. It's not fulfilling, and 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 you know, rather than being the little cuck in the corner, uh, you actually get to speak the truth which feels so bloody good. And, mm. and you get to be around like-minded people who care about the same things as you and who want the same things as you. And that's, that's a fulfilling process. And, you know, no one would choose misery today just because tomorrow might be miserable. It's always worth pursuing happiness and, and good right now to make it, to manifest it. Uh, you know, when people look at going back to club, oh, well, it seems inevitable that everything that we build is going to collapse. So why even bother? You know, well, of course, why bother? Because we, we can be happy for longer. <laughs> we can enjoy life more. And I think that's part of, uh, you know, our side of things is just, I don't know, we've got, I think we've got a good, there is obviously infighting, there are some cunts, but overall, like people are fucking nice. You know, we, we consider ourselves brothers. We're in it together. We're fighting the good fight. And, and I feel like there's honesty and integrity and dignity in that. And so, 
regardless of, of, of hope or not, it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting question. It's something you have to talk about. But it's still, your actions have to be the same. Strive ahead, you know, wave the banner. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the other thing we were going to talk about was, uh, was I guess, libertarianism. Because I, I, I understand that uh, you were originally kind of in the Ron Paul camp of libertarianism, and you've made your way over to nationalism, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd still say I am sort of a quite libertarian, but I'm, I also have nationalist ideas. And um, yeah, I'd say I'm dissident right wing now. But I, okay. yeah, it started off libertarian. Um, I was, I, you know, I used number one sort of media source for me was like the Mises Institute. So I'd listen to all their lectures and Tom Woods, Jeff Deist, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, read, read some of his books. Um, and that's, but, but that is very right wing stuff. It's not just, um, economic, uh, economically right wing. It's very culturally right wing. You know, Hopper, who's probably the greatest star from that camp, um, advocates being a radical conservative. Just you know, say no to homosexuality, <laughs> say no to degeneracy. Like you can't have, you can't be free people if you've got communist degenerates subverting your youth. You know, that's just like, you've got to physically remove these people if you're going to have liberty. So it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty fucking full on right wing stuff. Um, uh, my old man's right wing and I gave him democracy. Uh, what's it called? Um, the God that failed is that right? Democracy, the God that failed. Hans Hermann Hoppe's book. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't. I can't remember the title. It, it's it's a cracking read. Have you read it? Uh no. I've I've listened to a few of his his lectures though. Oh well, the, the lectures. I mean, he's he's quite tough to listen to because he's he's kind of autistic, isn't he? He sets up every principle right at the beginning, and he does that. For, so the lectures are difficult, and this. Uh, but I'd say reading his books far more enjoyable. It's called Democracy, the God that Failed. That's his fam most famous work. And um, very reactionary stuff. And it is, it is um, you know, anarcho-capitalist, but it's it's also really good right-wing literature. But I gave it to my dad. He was, he was quite appalled. He's quite conservative, but he's a dreamer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was just like, so wait, we're just going to kick communists out of our society? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, you know, here's the ethical justification for it, Dad. You know, uh, but he was, he was, he was, wasn't that taken by it. Um, well, I, but yeah, I think that, that, oh uh, yeah, uh, I think that in uh, I think that around 2012, because like the, since then, there's been a lot of guys flipping from the libertarian camp to the more uh, dissident right wing camp. And I've never actually been a libertarian myself, but I find that for a lot of young guys, uh, I can understand why they why it'd be an appealing an appealing ideology because um for for any young white guy the best thing you would want is an escapism from you know the horrible like anti-white global homo system that we're in and i think yeah. i think that kind of that's what uh that's one of the real driving uh kind of the forces between the lim limited government that they kind of just want any alternative to that but i'd say that uh one of the problems though with is that kind of like you said earlier you need to have like a sense of togetherness you need to have like a uh a community that that's really for you know you can't just like you you can't just like uh go off and have your own like plot of land and expect like you know the global homo to leave you alone though yeah yeah exactly it's um you know we are social animals and and no man is an island uh, so this is a big problem with libertarianism that they rarely talk about community formation. I will give credit to Jeff Deist. Uh, he's, he made an absolutely fantastic speech on that. Uh, I will comment it. I'll comment the link or whatever when we're done here. I'll find it. It'll, it. I can't remember the title of the speech. But he talks about how uh, government programs and stuff subvert uh, non-government institutions that, cr that really help foster community. Um, and things like, you know, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, I know it's not edgy, but it makes sense that things like if a guy's on welfare, he's not going to turn to his neighbor for help, right? He'll just go down to the government office and slam his entitled, you know, a fist on the desk and say, give me the doll, give me my cash, give me my benefits, right? Uh, I'm down in my dumps. He won't go to his neighbor. So the neighbor is alleviated of any duty to, to you know, other members of his community that are down on, down on their lark or having hard times in their life. And, and also, the, the, if, if you were to make an arrangement with someone you're helping, 
I'm sure I've helped people, you know, in, in my life. You put conditions on the help. You don't just say, yeah, I'll just fucking give you cash. Sign sign this bit of paper like it is at the dole office. You go, no, you've got to sort your life out. You've got to stop drinking. You've got to do this, you know. Um, hey, I'll introduce you to this company, or I know a guy who can give you a job. You expect these things, and if they don't fulfill those demands, you break off the relationship. So, uh, you know, this creates community, right? The fact that you have to help one another, but it also betters the person, and they become a functioning, hopefully. And and it, I think most people in their lives go through well, not most, but a lot of people go through shitty times in their lives. They're broke. And then they they pick it up and they're they they're back on the ball and they're employed again and you know uh, life goes on and it's a chapter that they they would rather forget and they become a functioning member of society again. Uh, when the government steps in to help people, they just become dependent, entitled slobs. Uh, they they it fosters parasitism. Parasitism is that a word? Parasitism. <laughs> There we go. Thanks, mate. It's always nice to chat to someone more educated than yourself, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, Dice goes through this, and he goes through all these examples of, and it, I think it is true that, um, especially particularly our governments now are very hostile to our civilization, to our communities. They want to break them up. They want to uh, uh, micromanage them. They want to tell you what to think, tell you who to marry. Um, tell you you know just every element of our lives has now been dominated by especially in england I, you're a canadian right so yes you've got the same shit mm -hmm. uh they're in charge of the schools they they have fucking uh attacked religion you know uh tried to undermine it all 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 government funded institutions are atheists and left wing it, it's you know it's it's there like fucking us over so i think when you when you get into libertarianism, it's giving you all the answers. It's like, well, of course, the government's behind it all. And uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, because I, 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 but... I think it needs to exist in a national and, and uh, cultural context. Like my friend uh, Arjun Templar had a great quote. What he said was that uh, all bad right-wing ideologies assume that everyone on earth is a white middle-class male. And, uh, and you know, one of my favorite speeches by uh, Hoppe was the one he made about the alt-right and what he said, and he basically annihilated every single one of the things I don't like about libertarianism in the first, like, uh, in the first, yeah. like, 10 minutes of the speech. He's like, uh, you know, a lot of libertarians will say that, you know, we need, uh, we, we want to have as limited government as possible, but what happens when we import, you know, a bunch of third world migrants who demand uh, government assistance. Well, you remove them. Oh, but you know, they'll say that that's racist. <laughs> and it's like, uh, yeah. the, the problem is, is that uh, you're not going to be able to have that system uh, with third world migration. I also don't think you're going to have it with a, um, with a multicultural state because there's always going to be someone offended by, by some, by something like, for example, I'm making a video right now about uh, preview for the next video. It's about, uh, it's about the history of Hungarian nationalism, but uh if you look at uh, the history in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was always someone angry about some decision. They're like they they couldn't make a decision that um, that satisfied everyone, and this generally just happens with uh, multi-ethnic states. Like you know, uh, there'll be a politician that'll say some one thing and it offends this. Like like I guess you could put up the, the example the uh, the gay and and Islamic examples that you know um, how is how is it that possible that they hold these uh, two groups on the left and it's because you know they've created this kind of victim hierarchy and that the the only real thing that unifies the left is kind of the uh you know uh power through victimhood and kind of leeching off of the wider system and you're not going to be able to have like a libertarian system when you have a situation like that yeah i they do not take into account most libertarians do not take into account the reality of of ethnic conflicts because there, it, it's a very individualist outlook, right? So it doesn't take into account groups and how groups behave and how groups compete, um, which is just part of life. I mean, we understand a lot of the grievance culture is because, you know, blacks have lower incomes or incarcerated at higher rates. So, you know, that's racism, right? Or, you know, it goes on, you can give 100 examples of disparity in outcome between groups. And we know, well, that's because groups aren't equal. You know, c'est la vie. Um, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of libertarians are anti-racist and sort of have a leftist perspective, so they they don't agree with that, right? They they sort of embrace this idea that with liberty, everyone will thrive. Um, <laughs> but 
But even assuming, even assuming that all groups are equal, let's just say all groups are equal and equally well off and have equal political dominance uh, or, or influence rather, uh, it, even assuming that, which of course is a fantasy world that doesn't exist, it's still in the best interest of any group to, to compete and to try and one-up other groups to gain more of their resources, to gain more influence and to dominate the others. So and then this is just the reality of the way human beings behave towards one another. And yeah, it's, it's tribal and it's not very sophisticated, but that just seems to be the, the way history has always played out. So I think, I think libertarians generally avoid that because they're so scared, like most of them are cucks and, and some of them are just really wacky. I'm sure you've seen the footage of the American Libertarian Party. It's just filled oh, yeah. with fucking wackos, right? Uh, they're not tuned into reality at all. So if you were to bring that argument to, to them and talk about, well, groups have always got an incentive to, to dominate one another and fuck one another over and compete for resources um, at a group level, they'll, they'll, they'll come back with something completely nonsensical about how, well, uh, you know, it's the government that makes them do that. <laughs> it's, the, it's the government. And it wouldn't be racism if it wasn't for the government. Like, you know, uh, all these welfare programs, man, it's making it worse. Like, it's it's quite it's quite a blind and, spot. If that was true, how you can... Do you really think any, like, white libertarians going to go into the south side of Chicago and say, hey, guys, you, you know that it's really the government's fault that your uh, your guys are poor. Oh, why don't you not... Why don't you get off welfare? Like, that's not going to work. Yeah, mate, just stop taking money from white people. Like, you'll be better off. <laughs> I mean, just give it up. You know, It's totally going to work out. Like, I promise... I, May, it's in this book, yeah. Just read the treatise on socialism and capitalism by Hans Hermann Hoffer, right? It all makes sense. And uh, yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna fucking work, is it? The other the other big blind spot they have is that they don't think there's a market demand for government. But but that's sort of self-contradictory, right? Because how do governments exist? And they'll say, well, the government's a monopoly, so therefore it, you know, but okay, it's most monopolies collapse in in free market systems, right? They eventually um, somebody else can provide a product that's either better quality or lo at a lower cost, lower price, or both, and, and that's it, an end of monopoly. Um, nobody, you know, with government, people do want government. Like, people demand it. And I was chatting to a libertarian, an anarcho-capitalist mate um, the other day, and we, we sat around drinking some beers, and he goes, there's no, there's no market demand for government. And I just turned to the table, and I'm like, who here's got a market to want the government? Everyone puts their hand up. And it's like, <laughs> there you go. We own property. We basically want a system that's going to defend it for us. We want, we want the barbarians kept at the gates. You know, we want a military. We want these things. And, it, it, and, it, and they come back with, oh, no, what you really want are services. You want the service of protection. You want the service of defense. You want, and it's like, yes, and you have to collectivize and pay for that. To, to get it powerful enough where you're safe, you know, where your where your people are actually protected. They but yeah, again, I mean, they don't do this. that would be uh, there's an example of that in South Africa that pretty much uh, the um, the private security companies have taken over the job of the police force since uh, the police there are so incompetent uh, and so corrupt also that uh, essentially every house has to have like this wall around it. And I right. mean, uh, you, you obviously don't want that as net outcome, but although you know you could argue that's Kind of an inevitable in their situation but um you know it, when i think of uh it's hardly desirable that, is it <laughs> yeah exactly but, yeah. and the other thing that the point though is that you know what we think of the things like classical liberalism it was designed to work in, in a european christian civilization like you know uh, the founding fathers of the united states were pretty explicit that it, that the united states was meant to be a European country. They were trying to create a European nation. They had that citizenship will be extended to white men, good character. Um, the same yeah. with Canada. They had a, a European exclusive uh, immigration policy. Well, up I, don't know, I don't know if the founders saw themselves as, as European. They saw themselves as a, as a kind of reaction to Europe, you know, yeah. and the political institutions of Europe. But you're right that they also understood that uh, this works for them. And like you said, white men of, of good character was, it was written down, you know, no one complained, <laughs> but they didn't, um, I don't think they used the word racist. There weren't people going, you're, 
you're a blooming racist. How could you write that down? They would have gone, you know, fuck off. We're trying to build a country here, mate. Hello? You still there? Yeah, yeah I also think ah, yeah, you're there. that uh, you, I... You're breaking up a little bit, pal. Kind of what yeah, I'm... I don't know if I, I'm breaking up too. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, it's still pretty bad. Do you want to work something out your end? I can't hear you, but I don't know if it's just me. <laughs> maybe the maybe everyone else can. Are uh, you back a bit? No. Oh, good lord! Oh, hello. Live on the internet and alone. Yeah. All right. Me? I'll find the chat. I will probably. Be oh. Mm. Oh, I can hear you. Oh, you're back. Hello. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay, I okay. can. I could just see you there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're back. Oh no, and breaking up again. That, um, uh, okay, good. Uh, so what? The... <laughs> yeah, I can't hear you, bud. Uh, shall we? We've been going for about an hour and a half. Shall we? Shall we wrap it up? I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. I, I can you hear me? I can hear you now. Oh, okay, good. Um, so yeah, we'll probably end shortly. But uh, I guess what kind of my uh, kind of my my um, th theory on that would be that you know I when I think of uh, uh, liberty, I I think that there's a mistake in in uh, assuming it that it means only like just like freedom to do, rather than I consider it more to be freedom to be. So like freedom to become like a, a self actualized. Uh, man really and that you know i think of say like my grandfather for example who would have been my age in the 1940s um you know would he, he have had the right to uh you know he, he he wouldn't have had the right to you know like marry another man or divorce his wife without um you know uh w without a purpose or he yeah you know his wife might not have had a right to abortion but at the same time you know he could have just gone about his day without you know worrying about being called racist or sexist and you know yeah you know he wouldn't have to uh his kind of beliefs, uh, or sorry, he wouldn't have his achievements called into question, you know, uh, he would have just felt that, you know, he, he existed in his land and it was a land for him. And yeah. I really think that that's a more free society than, than anything that r really we have in the present day. You know, uh, I, yeah. I think that, and I think that a nationalist regime really provides that much more than uh, m much more than simply saying, you know, we just need to limit the government. We just need to like eliminate the government, really. Yeah, a nationalist conservative one, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a socially conservative um, structure is uh, perhaps not freer, but more fulfilling. And uh, it, it's interesting, though, that um, I think the more realistic libertarians do recognize that, you know, let's say there was no government and we lived in a completely private law society. Yeah, 100% uh, capitalist. You're still going to have leaders. You're still going to have communities. Uh, people need to be led, and and within those communities, you're going to get thrown out, or you're going to get imprisoned if you break the rules. You know, government or no government, this is the way it's going to operate. Um, because people don't tolerate blaggers and cunts, basically. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you exactly. gotta, it's uh, that's the way it is, and so uh, people fall in line into these sort of uh, cultural norms and customs in which they're raised and and there's you know i never i've never felt oppressed by uh the culture of the village that i was raised in in england you know <laughs> exactly it, yeah. it, it wouldn't let me do anything i wanted but that isn't that you know there's this is the difference between say uh freedom and and liberty what you want is self-determination um for these people and for them to be able, kind of be able to work it out for themselves, I don't think um, I don't think a government is necessarily the best place to look for cultural guidance, you know, or or for for value generation, you know, to say the, this is what we believe. They can they should feed off us, you know. It should be should be um, more bottom up, and then you have communities with local leaders that that sort of are the big wigs, uh, the, the the top dogs. The, what what's the word that's 
that a hoppy uses i forget but you know the, the guys that are like clearly successful and emerge as natural leaders they they usually provide you know and and non-government institutions like the church provides decent moral guidance for people um of course in our society right now things like the church have been completely subverted by progressivism by cultural marxism i mean if you go into church being the church in england they're they're talking about Syrian refugees and how we've got to do more for them. It's just vomit-inducing stuff. Uh, I but have a funny, a funny story though uh, about that. Was I mean, just to, I'll, I'll I'll let you continue. But a funny story that I can bring up was that the the former church that I was at. I since I've moved recently, but uh, they basically were talking about uh, how the youth of today uh, th that they that the issues they want to tackle are racism gender equality uh refugees and sexuality and i'm like no one no person that no young person that goes to church want cares about any of these issues yeah god it's oh my god it's just painful isn't it it's supposed to be a bastion of a traditionalism and it, yeah. they've just been they've just been cucked like everybody else i think uh the church of england is really a good example of just it all going down the pan i mean and now of course the catholic church have got I mean, their Pope is just a joke. It's a joke, What the, the stuff this guy said. You just open your borders to the world, he said to Europe the other day. Just do, just let them all in. Uh, be a good Christian. It's like being a good Christian it was never about, you know, in, in for, for hundreds of years, for almost all of its history, of its 2,000 year history, Christianity has never been about destroying your civilization and destroying your society. So you fit, so, you know, in the name of what charity that's never been what it's about you mm -hmm. know it's enabled it's enabled uh, empires to be built and, and wars to be fought like it's not about being a, a little cuck i know a lot of people on the distant right will will look at christianity and say that that's one of the problems because they read i guess they read nietzsche and they say you know it's slave morality and it turns you into a weakling turn the other cheek but you look at actually the track record of christians they're, they're peaceful to their neighbors and they're charitable to those in their community. They've, uh, until very recently, they've never really been about, hey, let's, um, let's like just let millions of Africans come into our country. Like that, that's fairly recent, you know? Yeah. Well, not only <laughs> so, that, but uh, it's also really only come about after the sec secularization of Western society. I mean, Christianity seems to have, uh, um, seems to have post hoc adopted uh secular values really absolutely uh, that's very well that's very well put but yeah what i was saying about um cultural guidance or sort of where where the cultural norms should come from i i argue about this with millennial woes quite a bit because i do think it's it's more org organic and and he thinks no you need you need a strong man telling people what to think and believe and and creating that cultural identity for people to gather around what what do you think i actually might agree with him on that because i do think that uh culture is usually transmitted through institutions i don't i mean it doesn't necessarily need to be a government institution like for you had pointed out the church or you know this is what the universities used to be i mean if you look at in the 19th century uh it was required for people to to, to know how to speak latin and greek in order to just go to university alone and really it was in it was designed to uh, the the humanities. They were designed to really instill men with kind of that, the, you know, that very uh, sense of duty that Glob uh, talks about. And right. th this is something that really comes through institutions, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I, do think I, that, I agree. I, I agree yeah. on that. I, but I was thinking more like, um, you know, whether it's government or whether it's non-governmental institutions. That was the distinction I was looking for, but I think you've you've answered the question pretty much. So, yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. I, I'm not opposed to institutions. You know, I'm not I'm not so libertarian anymore. I'm more realistic about things. You know. Yeah, and I I, I think that that kind of is the uh, I think that I'd say what what I'd say about it is that you know you can have a more libertarian system, but I think that you know you need a framework around it to. Uh, to really have that and i in my opinion we, we need to really what the real goal needs to be to build that framework because i mean it's it's just rotten right now yeah and i think you know for european men or european man including the women in this i think that uh, a more libertarian uh you know liberty works for us you know it, it works well for us it doesn't work for all peoples and that's fine um so we need to be realistic about 
what we were talking about earlier that this can't exist in in a multicultural uh, multicultural social order that's that's in that's just at odds you know it's just uh you're going to be it's like headbutting a wall it, it's it can't work you can't meld these two things you can't just let people travel wherever they want and expect liberty to reign um but i do think typically speaking we've done pretty bloody well when governments have left us alone you, you know um uh, under monarchy right there were hardly any government services like the king mm. would tax very little and and he would give very little and basically you had to make it work on your own and then you look at what um, americans did building the freest greatest nation that's pretty much ever lived i mean i know in its twilight years now but um but still uh i think that what's been achieved is is when we're left alone we actually create beautiful uh, convivial communities and societies that really work and um you do need government there to ensure that there's borders and that you've got an army you know uh but i think we don't need um we don't need like government sponsored like cultural sessions for the kids you know what i mean it's it's going to get subverted like this is this is sort of asking for trouble well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not necessarily against things like museums and stuff like that being uh, being funded. But yeah, I mean, it, it is true that it has been in that it has been subverted within the last few years. And it, yeah, in, in the present day, I wouldn't trust the current governments with uh, I wouldn't trust them with anything, you know. God, no, they're traitors as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What's it like with this Trudeau scandal? I hear whispers of it, but I don't really, I haven't been following it. Is he, oh, is he fucked? I, I don't know. I mean, um, he, he look, it looks pretty bad because they're basically interfering with a, uh, with a criminal prosecution of a corporation. But yeah, I mean, the government in Canada is about as bad as it is in England. I wouldn't say that, uh, I wouldn't say we, ha we haven't seen things like, you know, the Rotherham scandal or quite as, quite as much terrorism. So it hasn't been like that egregious yet, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like the whole like multicultural um, ideology, they're 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 pretty much bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And yeah, I think that's pretty much um, the, you know, that is pretty much the um, the sign of a dying a dying civilization. And you know, uh, but I do think that uh, I do think we can definitely build something out of the. Uh, I, I do think that we can really build something for the future. So I wouldn't be too black. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I'll probably call it. I'll probably call it a stream at that. Uh, this has been an interesting conversation, Hugh, and uh, you're welcome back on anytime. It was my pleasure, mate. Really fun. Thanks. Take care.